Welcome to our worship today. It is the seventh Sunday of Easter. We can still say, He is risen, Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Um, I'm going to be doing this uh, service from behind the altar the whole time because I am unable to really walk very, very well. So I'm positioned nicely, and in full disclosure, just as those people are used to zooming, I'm wearing just shorts underneath. <laughs> but um, gosh, it's good to be here. And, and I ask God's blessing on our worship today and this Sunday and, and, and all the way through and, and give thanks to you for your being a part of it. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning them from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We confess our sins. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Our sins are forgiven. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So let us give thanks to God for his wonderful grace. And now that we have been so forgiven, let us forgive one another. Be at peace. Amen. The first reading for today comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, and then verses 21 through 26. During this time, after Jesus had ascended, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. This was written in the book of Psalms, where it says, Let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, Let someone else take his position. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. They nominated two men, Joseph, called Basarabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they all prayed. O oh Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in the ministry. For he deserted us and has gone where he belongs. Then they all cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other eleven. The epistle lesson for today is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Since we believe human testimony... Surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his Son. All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. So ends the reading. The gospel lesson for this, the seventh Sunday of Easter, is taken from John chapter 17, starting at the sixth verse. It's Jesus' prayer to his Father on behalf of his disciples then and still us today. Jesus prayed. Father, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everyone you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. 
I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you've given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you've given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I say these things so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these words be yours and bless. Amen. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me bear much fruit. When the church is so connected like that, the Holy Spirit, like life-renewing sap, gives each and every branch strength, vitality, and fruitfulness. And we so want that as branches. And yet we know that there are times when for a host of plausible reasons, the church, because it's made up of human beings, is not as connected with Christ as it should be. It's not so much the result of sin, even though the sin does take place, but our tendency to rely on lesser things. Instead of the Holy Spirit guiding us and taking over for us, we trust in our own logic, our own sense of order, our own traditions, our own SOPs, our own selves. Now, I wish that I had a a, a single, bona fide, straightforward answer as to when we are so intimately connected and when we're not. But I don't. And that would actually defeat the point. But instead, especially as we prepare for a significant congregational meeting today, it seems fitting that we use that first lesson that you heard and revisit the Matthias decision. Acts chapter 1 verses 15 to 26 showcases the church at its well-intentioned but misguided worst. Now I'll say up front, I'm on rather on shaky grounds here. Most commentaries are not as critical about this action as I am. But as I read it, it, it seems that like what many churches and denominations sometimes fall prey to leading to congregational splits, pastoral power plays, elder takeovers. Whenever the church, in its wisdom, acts as if it's all alone in the world, that Christ is not a significant present in midst and among them. Now, in the case in in Acts, it's understandable. Jesus had just ascended into heaven, and his closest followers... They're clueless. He tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit, for knowledge and power. And the first thing they do is call a meeting. And at the top of the agenda, maybe the only thing on the agenda, is choosing another apostle. I guess they forgot that salient point that Jesus had made. You know, you did not choose me, I chose you. But they deemed that this was a matter they had to take care of and take care of right away. As I said, it's understandable, well intentioned, but I think it merits a closer look. So here's what I have against the 
Matthias decision. Five points. Number one, the timing is off. Jesus said for them to wait, and they do, for an entire day, and maybe actually two. And of course, waiting is difficult. <laughs> Tell me, I know of late. And waiting for God, even more so. And how often we good church people feel that need that we have to rush the Holy Spirit into action as if nothing's going to get accomplished unless us human leaders hasten to change things, to seize the initiative, to strategize, to do something, anything. Maybe <laughs> we just need more patience, more faith, more trust, and maybe a few extra choruses of in his time. Yeah. Point number two. The rationale for what they do is faulty. What makes this such an important issue that it couldn't wait? A number. We're supposed to be 12. You know, 12 tribes, 12 months, 12 apostles. I mean, how's it going to look? We're one short. We've got to take care of this. Again, how often churches want things to be taken care of quick. They want things neat and organized. But the thing is, the people in those churches are not neat and organized. <laughs> I like to use the analogy between Pringles and normal potato chips. Pringles are all formed the same way. They, they stack nicely. They can be uniform in flavor. Potato chips are different sizes, shapes. They don't do anything except leave grease on your hands. That's what we have with people. Or more potato chips. As you may have noticed, most churchgoers, most churches are filled with uh, unstackable people. <laughs> people whose idea of discipleship varies from person to person, even from month to month. People who don't always show up for worship or work parties or potlucks or rehearsals or, or Bible classes. People who want to come to our services but not join. Or people who join but don't seem to come to our services. People who change their minds, alter their lifestyles, move, forget, say one thing and do the opposite. One pastor said that it's like herding cats. <laughs> the more you force it, the worse it gets. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I think 11 is a great number for disciples because it highlights the incompleteness inherent in any followers of Christ and maybe serves as a constant reminder to the rest of us who are deniers and doubters and deserters all that we are not ever complete. And also how quick and easy not doing what our Lord commands can be. Point three, the hermeneutic is flawed. Now, hermeneutic is one of those pastoral words, but it really boils down to how we interpret Scripture. It's like, here's what we want to do. Let's find some biblical support. A friend of mine in the seminary, when we were taking homiletics class where they teach us to preach, he would always say, I finished my sermon. Can one of you help me find a text to base it on? The Bible is a remarkable book. It's timeless. The record of God's love for his people. It's easily applied to almost any life situation. But it's also easily manipulated. I mean, do you really think that those two verses from the Psalms that Peter cites were actually written to apply to Judas thousands of years later? Probably not. But he sure made it sound like they did. That's called proof texting. Taking something usually out of context to validate some other aim. Jesus, in the prayer of our gospel, prays that the church never does that. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Truth. Not whatever it might be that we can make the words imply. Fourth point. The qualifications for apostleship are biased. 
I mean, what kind of man are they looking for? Well, Peter tells us, it is necessary to choose one of those who have been with us the whole time, from John's baptism to the time that Jesus was taken up for us. When Jesus proclaimed, the kingdom of God is at hand, his ministry captivated people, healed them, changed their way of thinking. It was a dramatic, dramatic, growing movement sweeping across Palestine from Galilee even into Jerusalem. People were healed, forgiven, called, convicted. And yet, anyone who joined somewhere along that way was not eligible. They missed the cut. That would include Lazarus, Nicodemus, Mary or Martha, Bartimaeus, the tenth leper, Joseph of Arimathea, James, Jesus' brother, and even most of the 11 disciples who weren't there when Jesus was baptized. They were all disqualified because they didn't have enough time in. Can you imagine a church ever saying that? You haven't been here long enough? Yeah, maybe you can. But when I read our mission statement, be one, be one, be wanting more, it demands that we actually exist for those who aren't here yet. We need to look beyond the old guard for input and leadership to seize the gospel's freshness on newly convicted hearts. If not, we're going to be the worst for it. Fifth point, <laughs> the means of selection of this apostle are suspect. I mean, they cast lots to find out which one. You know, here God, you decide, high roll wins. <laughs> I'll say no more about that, at least they prayed beforehand. You know, the fact is, by the end of Acts, it's pretty obvious that Matthias is not the twelfth apostle. Paul is. And he fit none of their categories. God chose him from among their enemies. He chose him, even though Paul didn't want to be chosen, knocking him literally off his high horse, turning the great persecutor of the way into its greatest missionary. And therein lies the key. How can our fervent faith be a patient, groping in the dark faith? We may not know where our next step will take us in following Jesus, but can we trust whatever it is that God has in store opening up before us? That's the unspoken but understood premise behind Jesus' prayer of protection that make up our gospel. Heavenly Father, he says, as you have sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I have given myself entirely to you so that they may be entirely yours. The path to success is surrender. And in so doing, that vine-branch connection is assured. Robert Putnam, in his classic work, Bowling Alone, isolates two kinds of connections that people make, bonding and bridging. Bonding happens when people who have stuff in common grow deeper relationships. Bridging happens when differences are actively overcome, bringing people together. Bonds are great. We forge them naturally and they make us strong. But the kingdom of heaven grows by bridging, reconciling people to God and one another. Jesus was the greatest bridger the world had ever seen, and that's his legacy to the church. So it's not so much whatever decision we make when we come together, but how we come to those decisions and how we live together after them. When this is understood and embraced, when the church is willing, like Christ himself, to suffer and even die in order to live, when we strive to be not just the best congregation in the area, but the best congregation for the area, Jesus' prayer is fulfilled. I go back to the last thing 
they heard Jesus say. As he ascended into heavens right before the clouds hide him, he tells them, you will be my witnesses. That's such a loaded phrase, but an even more loaded commandment. To be a witness, to remember who he is and what he has done and tell others, but also to bear witness, to be like him, following him, trusting in him until he returns. I don't think that the gathering to select Matthias was a good witness. It's nothing personal. Matthias was probably a nice guy. I'm sure he did something, even though the traditions aren't really clear. It's sparse about what he did, where he went, how he even died. But he was probably still the better choice of the two than the other guy who was Joseph, otherwise known as Barsabbas, otherwise known as Justice. Anyone with three names? But to me, it's the whole meeting is a good example of what not to do. Whenever the church acts in that way, relying on human standards and procedures, projecting itself rather than proclaiming Christ, going through the motions rather than getting into motion, they may still make decisions that are good, but it'll end up with a Matthias and not a Paul. Recognize that we are in the same situation they were, in between times, waiting for God, trusting in Christ who's not with us the way he was before to them. So in this meantime, can we be patient, faithful, vigilant, open-ended, and obedient? I think the better question is, can we afford not to be? God grant that and bless you as people. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We now lift up our prayers to our Father in heaven, confident in his mercy. We stand in the glorious light of the resurrection and we pray for the church, the world, and for all those in need. We pray. God of truth, sanctify your church in the truth. Bless all your institutions. Bless your gatherings, your schools, your seminaries, your your, your, every service organizations that do your work in this world. May we be faithful to the word. May we see it resonate in our hearts and guide our actions. We ask, O Holy One, that you protect your people in every land who face imminent danger and violence, bloodshed in the streets of Israel and Palestine, rampant deaths in India due to COVID, the devastation of floods and hurricanes and terrorist attacks and gun violence seem to surround us every single day. Send peacemakers, mediators, counselors, and healers to assist those in every nation to find peace and goodwill. Strengthen our resolve, O Lord, that our faith is in you, And despite whatever assails us in this world, that we knew you, we know your care and your comfort. Lord God, you um, you know the hearts of all your children. We ask that you touch those who are in need of healing. Those whom we think of and and name before you now. In your mercy, bless them. Assure them of your presence. May they sense that you are near. Be with caregivers, those that take care of loved ones and strangers alike, that they might have the the stamina and the love to share. Merciful one, watch over the children of our congregation, of our community, those around us. Grant parents and guardians the wisdom that they oversee their growth. 
Enable us to find ways to care and be blessed by their presence. And finally, kind and compassionate God, we, uh, we ask you to bless the dying and those who watch with them, those who mourn their passing. Keep us united with those who have gone before us in that communion of saints that we savor and yearn for when all time is fulfilled. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend these and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who gave us these words to sum up all we need ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the God of peace make you holy through and through. May you be kept sound in spirit, mind, and body, blameless before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will finish what he has set out to do in and through you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that's our worship for today. Thanks for being a part. It sure is good to be sort of back in the saddle again. Um, thanks for your patience. I have got, received so many cards it's been, been really gratifying and wonderful to get something in the mail every day. It's, it's, it's truly a blessing, and I hope that that's what happens to everyone that gets sick. And I'm not just special in that regard, but thank you, so many people. Um, a word to the wise that this upcoming week, uh, up until Wednesday, Terry will be out of the office. We'll have people volunteering and filling in. But if you don't get your phone calls answered or if you, someone's not here, um, you know, be patient. Um, be, be kind to one another, and, uh, and, and thank you very much for your love and support. Um, see you later. Hi there. We're super excited that this summer we have the opportunity to offer some on-site children's ministry events. Our first one will be summer kickoff. It is June 16th at 6 p.m. We'll be introducing the theme for the summer, Anchored in God. We'll be doing lots of outdoor activities to get ready, including some tie-dyeing of t-shirts, the Kona Ice Truck will be here, and a couple other projects to start your summer off. If you plan to bring your student in uh, grades kindergarten through fifth, please let me know by June 1st, and I'll also need to know their t-shirt size so we can have that ready to go for them. I hope you'll be able to join us at our summer kickoff and then also at the rest of our events throughout summer 2021. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye.